Welcome to Downtown. I'm your host, Robbie Haig, and today I am speaking with Blake Dinius, who is Plymouth County's entomologist and educator. And yes, I want to find out what that's all about, too. Thank Welcome. you so much. Yeah, it's I'm so glad good. to be here, Robbie. Well, it's so good to have you here, Blake. And entomologists, there are a lot of people out there who are not going to know what entomology is either. Sure. <laughs> you can start where you wish, Blake. Tell us a little about yourself. That sounds great. So entomology is the study of insects, but it does include a number of other kind of creepy crawly type things. So we do incorporate the spiders and the ticks, even though they're not technically insects, they're oh. arachnids. Yep. And okay. occasionally you will see people who study maybe millipedes and centipedes lumped in as the entomologists as well. Again, even though they're not technically insects. We know insects okay. are, you know, six legs, they tend to have three body segments, those types of things. A lot of insects have wings and ticks and spiders don't have wings. So there's, a, there's some distinctions, but we do kind of cover those topics. As long as they're, they tend to be more on the terrestrial land side, not, we don't study crabs and lobsters. Okay. Those, we leave I, those I didn't scientists. know a tick was an arachnid. Yes, yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. They're arachnids, yeah. Very good, very good. So um, how did you ever get started with this? That's a really good question. Uh, like most kids, I loved animals. I loved dinosaurs and sharks. And I grew up on a good piece of land, but it, I, I don't necessarily know if the large land was as significant as the fact that I just spent a lot of time outside. I was always playing in the woods, turning over rocks, turning over logs, looking for things. And what really appealed to me was the fact that insects are very adaptable to their environments and unlike sharks and dinosaurs, which you may never see unless you <laughs> right. go to a, a museum and you see a skeleton or an aquarium and you see the shark, but with insects you can see what I, I call like real life monsters. You can see them up close in your own backyard and a lot of people might be put off by how fast they move or how many legs they have, but at a really young age, I learned that they're not as scary as people think they are, yeah. and they're a lot of fun to observe. And you can find, more than anything, I think that people would be blown away by the number of species, the number of types of insects they find in their own backyard. Wow. When you go on a walk, you're unlikely to find a brand new bird that no one's ever seen in the area, or a brand new type of mammal, like a new type of, type of rabbit or a squirrel. But there are kids out there that might be surprised that in their own backyard they might find a brand new species of beetle that no one's ever seen in their entire town, or maybe wow. the county, or maybe even the state. They, they are just so many different types of insects out there, and there's always something new to see. Wow. So you are from Plymouth County. Yes. And it, it's... You said that there is also a, uh, an entomologist here in, on the Cape? Yes, uh, Larry Dapsis on the Cape. He's kind of my, he, he likes Star Wars a lot, so he likes to use, uh, like, I'm his Padawan, he's the Jedi Master kind of <laughs> analogy. He's a really great guy, really knows his stuff, and I'm very grateful for everything that he's taught me over the years, and I can say with certainty I would not have this position without him. But. It's significant because for people who are off the Cape living in Plymouth County, I'm your man. I'm the guy that you would want to come to. But for anyone living on the Cape, that Larry, you would, you would want to go through Larry. And we, we do collaborate on different events, but because our positions are funded through the counties, we do try to stay on, it, on our own turf, if you will. Oh, sure. Yes. Well, I'm glad you're on our turf. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and why is it so unusual that the county only has you two? It is a, a very unusual, unusual position. When I, as kind of, to be perfectly honest with you, when I was applying to this job, I actually didn't even realize that we had an extension program in the county. 
even though we had had it for many, many years. And I imagine that there are other people out there, maybe people listening right now, that also do not realize we have an extension program. And it's because this, here living in the Northeast, extension programs where we take information from universities and colleges and research institutions and we bring that to the public, that's actually very rare, even though you'd think in the Northeast because we're, we consider ourselves educated and yes. we've got so many great schools that that would be prevalent. It tends to be less common here in the Northeast as it does maybe in the Midwest or down South. Mm. Um, but yeah, again, the positions that Larry and I have are unique to the counties and that partly, I believe, that's due to the fact that we, we have county government in Plymouth County and in Barnstable County. Okay. Now, I did uh, read that UMass Boston is the city's only public research university. That's really, that's news to me too, even though I attended UMass Boston. Yes, um, that's why The fact why that it's the it only up. research uh, institution in the city, that, that's, that's really cool. It's great to know. Really? Now, do you think that's because you haven't been widely used over the years? Maybe as uh, more people, ha more towns have their own entomologists, maybe that will spike the university. I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely sure. It, it's, it's possible, but I don't see us competing with any of, of what the research institutions do. For example, UMass Amherst out west, they have a very well-developed extension program as well. They serve the, basically that whole, they try to serve the entire state, but most of their influence I find is over in the Western side. And they're great at what they do, but we work together. You know, when, we're, when I'm out West, we, we, we collaborate with the researchers over there, and I see this more as a team rather than a competition between things. When it comes to education and teaching people, it's not about being a star, it's about being a team. And so the more you get the message out there, the more people know, and that only becomes something better the more people are doing it. I like it, very good. And I like that you are also, your title is also entomologist and educator. Yes. <laughs> I like that, that that's really good. So you, you did go to UMass Boston. Yes. It, it was a great school. I had a great time there. In terms of what I, what I would, I guess, as a message to, to children that maybe are thinking about going to college, uh, I selected UMass Boston because it was, you know, in terms of finances, it was, it was very affordable. But also, it was just a great opportunity for me to have a new experience outside of the town that I went to. There were subjects, there were professors and subjects in particular fields that I thought were fantastic. And it was just a, a, an amazing experience. I would highly recommend uh, UMass Boston to anyone considering going to school. Oh, that's very nice of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, since you brought in ticks and spiders, <laughs> tell us, and since it's summertime, and of course I think there's not a person uh, around who is not concerned about ticks in the summer. Sure. Well, we could talk for days, <laughs> I swear, <laughs> about ticks uh, because... So kind of to give some background, when I got this position, I was actually working with honeybees. I feel like most of my research is actually in the bee world, working with honeybees. I did some work with earthworms, which are not insects, but again, we kind of include them. Springtails, again, not insects, but we kind of include them. <laughs> uh, ladybugs and lacewings, which are insects, but I primarily focused on honeybees. And when this job came around, uh, they are advertising someone to teach people about ticks. And I thought, well, I don't really know a lick about ticks, <laughs> and, but I understand how to read scientific journals. I understand the scientific process. I've conducted my own research. I know what to do. And I, I guess, again, that might be an, another important message that you don't have to be the expert at anything if you want. You just have to give it a shot. And I applied to this, and what was significant, and I, I believe my boss came down and told me she hired me based on 
the, the type of person that they wanted for this particular role. But in any case, I learned a ton about ticks in a very short span of time. And again, we could talk forever about ticks. So if people want <laughs> to know yeah. about maybe a few <laughs> bullet points, maybe we can just hit a few bullet points about what people can do when it comes to ticks. Yeah. Uh, the first thing I would recommend that everyone do, and you can do this right now, and I, I will tell you, if you don't like who I am, you, you start doing this and I will no longer have a job. That's <laughs> basically, that's how effective this stuff is. Okay. There's this spray. You get it and you only treat your clothes with it. It's not like a off that you put on your skin or anything like that. It's called permethrin or permethrin. And that's the active ingredient you find on the bottle. You treat your clothing with it and this stuff lasts for about a month or through six washings. And it's the most effective defense you ha can have against ticks wow. when you're out walking around. Because it doesn't just repel ticks, it actually will kill them that are crawling up and over your clothes. So the tick, people always ask me, they say, my dog wears a flea collar, why can't I have something like that? <laughs> well, this is the, the closest thing, because if you treat your clothing with it, any ticks that crawl up and over the clothing, it's kind of like the same kind of thing, the flea collar, it's going to kill the ticks that are crawling on it, and it's very Great. highly effective. And so, and the second thing that I would mention is, and you know, wearing, wearing repellents on your skin, that's always a good thing, but it's not as effective as the permethrin, is that tick checks are something that everyone groans. Whenever I give this, I can see people just check, like I give the presentation and people are just like rolling their eyes, tilting their, and I get it, right? When I was a kid, I didn't even want to brush my teeth every night. So <laughs> you, you know how it is. So telling someone on our already busy schedules to do one more thing, and you scroll through social media, people even tell you how to relax. 15 ways on how to relax, and you're like, oh God, I gotta carve out time. But in any but case, long story their short, own right? Benefit. Exactly. They shouldn't roll their eyes at that. Exactly. And the time that you save by not going to the doctor, it's time well spent, right? That's the way I look at it. But tick checks are super important. If you, if you can't always see areas of your body and the, the ticks are very tiny this time of year, use your fingertips. Like on the back of your head, neck or on your ears, places that you can't see, your fingertips are very sensitive. The tick is going to feel a little bit like a hard seed or a scab. Don't just pick it off. Have another person take a look and, and, and check that out. Because sometimes I have had people tell me they've picked off scabs and that's no fun. Yeah. And then the third and final thing I would recommend is that if you do get bit, that you have that tick identified in some way or another. And you can do that for free. You, just, you don't have to bring it to your doctor. Everyone has cameras on their phone. Take a picture of it and send it to the University of Rhode Island. And they have a website oh. called Tick Spotters. It's all one word. Oh. And they'll identify it for free. And so that's important information that you can tell your doctor, especially now we're living, and I hate to bring it up, we're living in the era of COVID. But the symptoms of many of these tick-borne diseases, they overlap with so many different types of sicknesses, including COVID. And it can be, wow. and so if you try to look it up online, you're gonna come with, you're gonna feel like you have everything. And you're gonna be like, oh, I have COVID, I have Lyme disease, I have anaplasmosis, I have all these different things. But uh, again, identifying that tick, telling your doctor, because the diseases, the germs that are within certain ticks are not present in others. So for instance, like Lyme disease, the germ that causes that, that's only present in your deer tick, not your dog tick. And for those okay. living on the Cape, the Lone Star tick, it's not present in that. And so again, telling your doctor, hey doc, look, I was bit by a tick a few weeks ago because we know the onset of different diseases happened about three to 30 days, on average about 10 days. So if you're bit two weeks ago by a deer tick, well, you know, it could be Lyme, right? Sure. And a doctor, a medical expert is going to be able to make that judgment call, make that, give their opinion on what they want to test for, what they want to treat. So because you, we, you suggest also keeping the tick. Yes, definitely. Keep it, identify it, try to remember the date. If you need to write the date, the best thing to do, put it in a bag, write the date on the Ziploc bag that you're a bit, take a picture of that, send it to tick spotters, and hold on uh -huh. to that tick. Yeah. Excellent. And another interesting thing is um, we know that ticks lo live on blood. Yes. Yes, and uh, one of the shocking things about ticks, there's many, again, the insect world is so full 
of so many different shocking things that I find even myself, who has been studying ticks and learning about ticks since I was a young boy, still continually blown away by these. And it, again, at learning about ticks, the, one of the things that stood out to me the most is that ticks live for about two years and they only ever eat three times and they exclusively feed on blood. And so wow. that's basically it. It's just a crazy life that ticks have. Three times. Yes. Amazing. Yes. They're certainly not part of the human race. <laughs> no. <laughs> and they've been around for about 400 million years. Really? As older than dinosaurs. Wow. About as old as horseshoe crabs. And we, just within the past few years, have heard about Lyme disease. Yes. That's, That's interesting. Yeah, it, it is interesting. What we are realizing with a lot of these tick diseases is that there's a number of in the science world, it's hard to know anything for a fact, right? So there's, okay. But there's a lot of very well-educated guesses. And we believe that there's a number of different factors at play, starting from, let's say, the 80s and continuing on for the, over the past 40 years, a number of different changes that have occurred that have contributed to these different diseases. Some of those things are the way we're handling nature, the way we're changing the world around us. Other parts, another aspect is the fact that we are learning a lot more about these ticks. So the medical community is getting smarter, scientists are getting smarter. When, when Lyme disease came out, it was kind of a wild thing. We, we thought it was juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Uh -huh. And it wasn't for the fact that there was this string of kids living in the same area that were coming down with this and Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis should be pretty rare, and the fact that they were in the same area, that kind of gives you some wow. information about, it's a puzzle, right? It's, it's a mystery to try to figure out. And it, we pinned down the fact that it was caused by ticks. It was just kind of a serendipitous discovery with a gentleman that was, had, had been previously researching ticks, just happened to be part of the team investigating these, wow. this situation with these kids. And, this is kind of a cool thing. Wow. It makes me think also that botulism, which is used for getting rid of wrinkles, mm -hmm. is also a byproduct of food poisoning. Yes, yeah. You don't think about that. Mm -hmm. That came by, you know, as, as an aside. Yeah, there are the science, well, I mean, the science world is, I get, not just the insect world, but the science in general yeah. is, is just, they say, what is that expression? Life is stranger than fiction? Yes. And it's definitely true. There are so many really crazy discoveries that people learn about wow. every single day. And our world, we talk about, when you look, open the news, when you listen to the news and you hear about people wanting to explore, this, this is to get on my soapbox, something that I'm very passionate <laughs> you go about, right, ahead. right? We talk about wanting to explore outer space, life on other planets, uh, something new, something different, something fascinating. But we have here on Earth so many mysteries still left to be discovered. It's why aren't we just looking in our own backyards? Why are we off spending millions of dollars in space when there are so many new, brand new things to be discovered? I think people have felt like we've exhausted the mysteries here on Earth, but we are not even scratched the surface. Wow. It's kind of like the brain. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. There's so many new things. Just kind of a, just a really good example, again. Bees are kind of one of the things that are near and dear to my heart. Very good. Just last year, we, we learned that bees and flowers communicate with each other on an electromagnetic basis. So there's oh. actually electrical signals that flowers and bees are using, and they respond to each other in those particular ways. Something brand new that we didn't know before. Wow. We knew that bees tend to be positively charged and flowers tend to be negatively charged. We used to think that that was solely because it made pollen stick to the bees better. But now we okay. know that bees can remember flowers by, based on their electrical charge. Really? And flowers will actually respond by releasing a plume of scent as the bees flying by. So imagine kind of walking, you know, as you walk through JCPenney or yes. Macy's, you get the perfume <laughs> aisle and they kind of, it's like that. 
And that oh, makes sense, right? For a flower, yes. a flower doesn't want to be releasing scent when there are no bees around, but if a bee flies by and it can feel that electrical pull, poof, like that yeah. scent, and that's brand new, something we learned last year. Isn't that interesting? And it happens every, every single day I walk into my office, I find something brand new that someone has discovered and it's just crazy, you know. Wow. It's a crazy, it's a, it's a really interesting thing. There's always something new to discover. Well, you're really jogging my mind. I, <laughs> I love nature. Absolutely. And there are so many things in nature that happen we know nothing about. Absolutely. Like why the lead bird in a flock tends to go to the back to rest and someone else takes over in the lead. Yes. This is... Wow. And those are wow. questions I think as a young boy, I always had those questions. And I just never grew out of it. I think some adults just grow to accept things the way they are. Oh, that's just the way it is. Yeah. But that was never yeah. satisfying for I me. Love and I would it. definitely <laughs> endorse that message to any kids growing up is don't settle for that's just the way it is. Continue asking why cuz it's going to never it doesn't they, it does, has never steered me wrong. It's gotten me into the world of science. Very good. It's continued to help me grow as a person. It's like butterflies. Why do they all go to the same place on the map? Mm -hmm. All the, the monarch butterflies? The yes. Yes. Yeah, they have a really interesting migratory pattern. There are some scientists who do think that they're following, uh, again, kind of electromagnetic signals wow. in the sky, things that we can't see, right? And we can only take guesses at these things, but it is a very fascinating, very beautiful uh, insect in the fact that it does undergo this really wild, kind of interesting migratory behavior. And getting back to ticks. Sure. I hope we're not grossing people out there, but <laughs> this is very interesting to me. In the food chain, yes. everything has its purpose. Mm -hmm. You don't feel that way about ticks? Well, when it comes to understanding, I, I, people like the idea that things have a role or a purpose. And in nature, what a lot of biologists will say is, they'll ask the question, Can, is it something that has adapted to the environment? And if the answer is yes, then they don't worry about a specific purpose. But I can tell you certain things that might be surprising about ticks that people, that the audience might want to know. Um, the first thing, which is usually something that people are disappointed when I tell them, is that possums do not eat ticks. A lot of people think that they do, but that the stu and this is, I guess, a classic example of what I believe my particular role, why I exist in this particular role. So as the entomologist educator for the county, my job is to not just read Facebook or Google and find things online, but to actually look at primary literature, research that is being conducted by scientists, and take that information and bring it to the public's ears and let them know the truth, the facts. And that particular, so that, that is a myth that's being perpetuated online and has been for quite some time. It's based on an older study where the researchers placed possums inside cages and they placed 100 ticks on the opossums and they held those possums overnight without any other food source. And so the, and when they woke up in the morning, the ticks weren't there. Oh. And they assumed that the opossums had groomed them off. Yeah. But they didn't know because they didn't look at the stomach contents of the opossum or anything like that. They just assumed that because the possums were held over a water bath, that the ticks hadn't fallen in the water bath and the opossums had groomed them off. But what happens outside in nature is different than what an opossum will do within a cage. I mean, if you put me in a room with only cheeseburgers, <laughs> I mean, I'm probably going to eat 99 out of 100 cheeseburgers, right? If I'm bored and I have nothing else to do, and I'm hungry and I have no other food. And so it, it doesn't replicate nature perfectly. And that's where this myth had come across and people are like, no, that's what happened. And they get very serious. But science, as a scientist, I take that and I say, that's a great starting point. Now let's see what happens in nature. And 
scientists, another brilliant scientist, they, they did ask that question. And so they did look at opossums in the wild and they found that out in nature, opossums don't have that behavior. They looked at the gut contents of opossums. They looked at the, the opossums, their, the DNA and the bowel movements of the opossums. And they found no trace of any ticks oh. in, those, in those opossums. I have heard that turkeys will eat ticks. I don't know how true that is. That, again, is a little bit of a... The, bird, the, the thing with ticks, it, so when people always want something to eat the ticks, right? Mm -hmm. That birds will occasionally eat ticks sometimes. But they're not a significant... Uh, at least what I've seen, they don't play a significant role in controlling tick populations. Oh, okay. What is going to be the largest factor in controlling tick populations are the environment, is the environment with which the ticks are in. They're going to be very, very sensitive to things like sun and wind and drying conditions. And also, uh, what's really important to ticks is not what feeds on them, but what they feed on is very significant. Okay. The, the, sig the presence of not just deer, but about 150 different species of animal, including 82 species of bird. Things like robins in your backyard, people love to see, but it takes feet on them. And then, uh, chipmunks and squirrels and rabbits, all these different things. There is one insect that does pr uh, parasitize, it's a parasite of ticks. It's a wasp. So people malign wasps, they don't like wasps. But yet one of the only things that we know is, gonna, is, is, is actively going after ticks is this particular wasp. Wow. And it has a really fun name to say. It's called Exotophagus hookeri. It doesn't have a common okay. name. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a funny, really long name. It's kind of fun to say. You can use it in Scrabble or, or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, with what is one of the most fascinating things that you found in your own backyard? Just, just uh, this past weekend, I actually found this beetle called a red-headed ash borer. And it's not the first sighting in, in, my own, in, in Plymouth County, but it's a very rare beetle. Uh, it's the first sighting I've ever seen. It's the first sighting ever in Carver, which is where, where I live in Carver, Mass. And so no one's ever seen it in Carver. So I found it yesterday. No really? one's seen it in Carver. Oh, no, sorry, it wasn't yesterday. I, for, today's Tuesday. I saw it on Sunday. And... It was wild, but here, here's the thing. If you aren't looking, if I wasn't looking, I would have missed that amazing experience of being the first person to find that yes. in my town, right? Right. And without the knowledge on identifying it. So what I would recommend to people is take as many, if you see something cool, take a picture of it. You never know if that might excellent. be something special, right? And they have excellent apps on phones now that are great. They're not perfect but they're good at identifying things. Anyone with a phone can, can download an app called Seek, and you just point the, point the phone at whatever you want to, it could be a plant, it could be an insect, Wonder. it could be anything you want to identify. You take a picture, you can snap a picture, and you can create a collection. People, try, people love collecting things, and yes. create a collection of different sightings that you've had. Very good. Well. Uh, we're kind of sort of running down on time, and I do want to uh, mention that you have a butterfly and insect walk yes. happening on June 26th, and uh, can you be a little more specific? Where is the walk happening, and how can some people get in touch with you to go on the walk? So you can always reach out to me at my email and, and phone. Yes. My email would be my first initial last name, so B D I N I U S, at Plymouth County MA dot gov. And there's no space in the Plymouth County MA. It's, that's just all one string of, of, of letters. Or my phone, which is 774 773 3404. The walk itself, I think, is going to be amazing. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm not, to, not to hype myself up too much. But I always get super excited about leading these walks, especially the timing of this walk is right in the middle of like kind of late spring, early summer. There's going to be a lot of things out flying, great weather, and it's a great location. So we're going to have this in Miles Standish. Again, 
what a lot of people don't realize in Plymouth County is that Miles Standish is such a unique habitat and we have found so many really interesting things in, in that forest that people would not believe we have. So I think people are gonna, we're gonna, the idea is that we're gonna walk through the woods and we're just gonna identify everything we see. We're gonna find things that we see, we're gonna identify, I'm we're gonna teach people about them. To June 26th. And the amount of diversity I think people are gonna find there is gonna blow their mind. That is fantastic. Everything you've talked about interests me. <laughs> I hope it interests my people out there. Absolutely. I'm sure it will. And it has been an absolute joy to have you here. Thank you, Robbie. It was really great I, to be here, too. I look forward to June 26th, as I said, and I'm hoping you out there will also be interested enough to get in touch with Blake. This is Robbie Haig for Downtown, and thank you so much for being with, with us. Thank you. Thank you.